Great, so we're here at the World Creators Summit and I'm here with uh, Richard Conlon, uh, who is the Senior Vice President of Corporate Strategy, Communication and uh, New Media at Broadcast Music Inc., uh, better known as BMI. So hi, Richard, and uh, great to have you on the show. How's it going? Oh, it's going great, and thanks for having me here. Great. So first of all, I want to delve straight into the technology side of things because here we're seeing a big, uh, still a, quite a big divide bet between uh, the, the creators and, and, and technology companies and there's quite a bit of animosity still happening here. But uh, as far as the BMI is concerned, uh, how has your relationship with the technology sector evolved and, and how do you feel it, it is right now? I think the word evolved is probably the, the key point of that. We got into this market early on. And in fact, we did the first deal, the first blanket copyright licensing deal for music on the internet. So I think there are natural tensions. And, and whether it's characterized as a Northern California, Southern California thing, or whether it's a tech versus creative community thing, there will be tensions between these two parties. But I can say that we've been able to navigate for nearly 15 years, uh, probably more, and navigate and define and create relationships with the tech community that work. So I'm very positive and I remain positive in terms of the future relationship. Uh, we need each other. Yeah, yeah sure. And uh, looking at, for example, uh, a one uh, an example or, or two, uh, if you want, of, of a successful partnership with a technology uh, company, what, what would you highlight? There were probably two of them. Uh, one of them was our first deal. It was with a company called OnRamp. And this was the, the first license for music on the internet. And we view it as a success. Um, the industry was sort of um, outraged because the industry, uh, the music industry at the time, was still in a, a mindset that we needed to either own them or stamp them out. And so BMI made a decision because we come at things from the perspective of, of, of monetizing an intangible right that we wanted to set the market and build a foundation. So, so the first one was probably our on-ramp deal because that was the first deal and that really got the global music market going digitally from a copyright perspective. And uh, so that was a very exciting piece. Probably the second one was when we started feeling the markets turn and we felt the capital markets turn. And that was the our mp3.com deal. And this is, this is ancient history now, certainly for, for many. But uh, in, in that case, uh, mp3.com was uh, either was about to or already was a publicly traded company. And one of our concerns was, what's going to happen if this gets away from us? Now, luckily, uh, here in the U.S., the economy and the flow of capital became our friend. With regard to mp3.com, they were flailing about a little bit. They were being sued by labels. They were the poster child for bad behavior from some. And that started to affect their stock price, and it started to affect the perception of the company. Now, we were at a critical point there. Yeah. Um, either, and then we were, we were on, uh, on the cusp of, again, doing the first deal with them, and it was probably their first major copyright licensing deal. So we did a deal, and we did a deal on a Thursday evening, and when their stock opened the next morning, it was up by 30%. Wow. So that, to me, was a critical turning point because it told us that when, the, when, when copyright is licensed properly, when the risk and, and the, the threat of infringement goes away and the company is seen as a good player, that the money will flow in. Yeah. And that was really a moment when we said, this is great because now the big boys and the big girls will know that they want to secure their rights if they want to secure their capital. Absolutely. Very interesting. And, and uh, I was listening to an interview that you gave to TechCrunch a couple of years ago at SF Music Tech, and uh, you were talking already about uh, what is uh, the, the old rage uh, debate now, which is uh, access versus ownership. Right. And uh, of course, you know, the things are evolving uh, perhaps slower than some journalists had expected uh, uh, in terms of the, of the shift uh, to the cloud and the shift to, to subscri subscription services. And uh, in fact, the CDs and, and downloads are still doing really, really well. And so do you see this uh, as being always a two way street uh, where we're always going to have uh, some component of ownership because people like that and some component of, of uh, uh, streaming access yeah I think it'll I think there'll be a hybrid model I think the, the one the one thing that we've learned is this myth of of overnight poof change in any world this is evolutionary I do think we'll see a multi-track marketplace I think we'll see a marketplace where there is more streaming and there is more much more of an access environment I mean I think if you look at, at the reports on the new Apple iRadio service, and you you read some of the analysis around that, that people are saying, well, gee, it's filling a hole in their portfolio, but it's really a radio service driving downloads. So I think they can mutually coexist. Um, I do think we see consumer behavior moving more towards streaming and more toward access. But I think you're still going to want to have a device that's not dependent on connectivity. And I mean, we're not in a perfect, ubiquitous, connected world yet either. So sometimes it's nice to have something on your device. Yeah. And you know it's going to play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking at the cannibalization side of things, uh, of course, uh, the figures are, are very difficult to uh, 
pin down because there's some people that are uh, concerned with cannibalization that when seeing projects like uh, Daft Punk where they did a pre-stream the week before the album came out and then they put it straight on Spotify and that's selling uh, great. Uh, others are looking at the, the long tail and, uh, and saying that uh, perhaps the, the the, the big sellers are not affected by the, the longer tail of albums might be affected by by streaming uh, so what's it what's the take on on, on this uh, sort of cacophony of, of opinions uh, that don't really have any practical basis yet uh, in, in 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 real terms right <laughs> opinions versus facts right yeah, so exactly. we, we can all have our opinions but but uh, the facts are the facts and here are some facts that we've assembled in terms of the streaming universe what we find is in a streaming universe as opposed to a, a buy universe you're seeing the access model um, exploited. Yeah. You're seeing more titles played. You're seeing on a, uh, whether it's a radio service or an interactive streaming service, you're seeing a million different unique titles every quarter yeah. being accessed. So I think as we look at this, what we might see is that, that one of the turning points will be how, how deep are you going? You mentioned the long tail. How, how, how far down the tail are you going? And I think we'll go farther down the tail on streaming because if something pops into your head and you say, boy, I want to hear that song, if I'm in a $10 relationship and I can get it for free, I'll do it. I might think about it if I have to, if I have to pay $1.29 or $0.99 cents or what have you. So I think that one of the, the key differentiators with streaming will be that it'll be deeper catalog use and it could be more casual or perhaps more a more fanciful, momentary, I want to hear that song from and, and having a place to go get it as opposed to have to buy it. Sure. Uh, looking at the digital revenues of uh, of societies uh, uh, like yourselves, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, something that I didn't know personally that uh, the digital uh, side is, is still relatively small. So uh, for BMI, or, or, or what does it represent or, uh, out of your overall uh, uh, revenues? In terms of what we break the revenues out domestically. So if you look at it just uh, just on a domestic basis, we are somewhere circa ten percent of domestic revenues coming from the digital world on our inbound international revenues for the use of our of our of our repertoire outside of the US we haven't done that break yet cuz yeah. obviously the reporting's not always there yeah. but if domestic is a barometer uh, it's it's hovering somewhere circa 10% and i think one of the things you have to think of there is that we're not just a feature music company. So BMI has always been in the film business. We've always been in the television business. We've always been in the arcade business. So um, when we see digital, it's a complementary piece. We're not seeing that radical shift that all of a sudden everything's going to veer to the left. There'll always be hotels. There'll always be restaurants. There'll always be television stations. So for us, um, we're kind of liking the 10% number, and, and uh, we've been growing that and you know, year over year in the you know, circa 20% range. Yeah. And how many digital services uh, has is BMI licensing right now? If you count everything that has a BMI license, that would include websites, it would include radio stations that are covered for their internet sites, for their streaming sites, we're hovering just over 10,000 properties. Wow. Um, a lot of that, again, are bundled radio sites. A lot of it are sites where, with Live 365, for example, we did a deal that covers many different micro sites, but um, it's, 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 it's hovering around 10,000 properties that are licensed by BMI. That's impressive. And looking at uh, the, the the U.S. space specifically, uh, it, the, the society is working a little bit differently than than they do in Europe. And so uh, we're seeing a, a shift from a couple of the major publishers to to go through uh, to direct licensing uh, for uh, for their catalogs. So do do you see that as being a, a potentially problematic? Or uh, I've even heard people say that it could be. Uh, positive if uh, societies can actually uh, go and try and match uh, the deals that uh, that the individual private companies have managed to get from the likes of Pandora, for example. Right. I think th everything that's happened with digital rights withdrawal is a very clear message um, to the societies and to the marketplace that our publishers and our writers weren't happy with how they were being paid and how much they were being paid. When you think about it in publishing, um, when you looked at a whole world and you looked at, at all of the exploitations, there was a robust mechanical stream, there was a performance stream, there was a synchronization stream. As the mechanical stream has waned, you say, how are we going to fill that? Performance income has been growing, but I think when you look at, at performances, let's, let's think about uh, sound recordings and the, the, digital, you know, the digital performance right in a sound recording. When you look at the, at the, the differentiation between what's being paid for public performing right in a sound recording and what's being paid for a public performing right in a musical work, and that's running somewhere circa 12 times more for a sound recording, you have, you have a problem. It's, we have a problem. So I think that's where, and I think it's been publicly stated certainly, that's where this the, the all withdrawal really emanated from was the desire of the owners of the copyright who we serve to get better valuation, number one. Number two, it was a, a commentary 
on the rates that were coming out, certainly out of our regulatory model. Yeah. So it begs two questions. One, are we making enough money? And two, is the regulatory structure, which the, the basis of which is, is more than 50 years old, is that still right? Yeah. And uh, following up on that question, uh, we heard uh, Maria Palante yesterday outline uh, the, the uh, proposed uh, review of copyright and how that might work, uh, uh, although of course that's, uh, that's all down to Congress really and, and uh, how that's going to play out. Uh, what are your feelings about it? Of course, you know, there, there, there are two ways it could go. Uh, it could get stuck immediately in yeah. sort of nitty-gritty negotiations between uh, uh, lobbying parties and, and different stakeholders, or people could actually decide to come together and, and make this work. Uh, did, where do you think it's going to go, and are, are you optimistic about it? I think it's an enormous undertaking. When you think about it, 1976 was the last time we had sweeping reform. That being said, I think there are some key factors right now in the way that we're valuing and regulating copyright that are begging for scrutiny. Yeah. The fact that we have different standards on valuation, we have different judges who are setting different rates. The judges are, in some cases aren't even allowed to look at each other's findings, even though they know they're out there, they, they can't take them into consideration. Yeah. So I think when the registrar has, has come out with this, with, with this call for copyright reform, I think it's, I think it's a, very, a very good thing. Yeah. It's an enormous undertaking, and I think that if you combine that with some of the, uh, the guidance we were given uh, from the from the Congress in, in one of the panels yesterday here at the summit, it says we need to get around the table and thrash this out and come to a market based solution. And in a perfect world, we need to just start evolving and determining the steps. Yeah. Uh, because I think if we if we're to look at the seventy six uh, reform, that took many 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 years for that to happen. And I think we need we need a more immediate solution. So I think we need to bite off, identify pieces, bite them off come to industry consensus, come back to the judiciary with a market-based solution that people can pretty much get behind. Yeah, and uh, the congresswoman that spoke last night, actually, she, she highlighted the fact that it's really down to the industry to get its act together and present uh, Congress with a, with a sort of a unified uh, opinion or structure of, of how things are going to work. Because, of course, if you leave Congress to, to their own devices, the, you, know, you never know what's going to come out of that. I'm, I'm, always, I'm always so much more comfortable, even if it's not the, the best outcome for any one party, I'm so much more comfortable with a market-driven solution as opposed to asking Congress to step in and referee. And then, you, then you've added a whole new component in terms of special interests that will get involved and how things can divert and work their way through the system. So I'm a big fan and we're big fans at BMI of, of getting market-based solutions. And finally, we're here at the World Creator Summit, and uh, there's a, a bunch of different creative industries that are taking part. And, and uh, BMI also works, uh, as you mentioned, with the movie industries and, and all sorts of different industries too. Uh, you know, do, do you find that there are points of contact in the issues that uh, uh, you know, visual arts, photography, uh, movies are having uh, in, in this new uh, digital age uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, the help and, and also the hindrance of technology? And uh, do you feel like uh, there, there are some ways that uh, you know, CSAC can help all these industries uh, uh, come together and, and bundle is, uh, as one voice uh, in matters like the copyright review, for example? I think we have to. And, and I think one, one of the great things that happened, I served on the organizing committee for this event, and that the organizing committee included Directors Guild and Screenwriters Guild and music representatives and representatives from the visual arts from all around the world. And I think one of the things that's going to make us successful is, is distilling all of this dialogue and all of this chatter into a, a, a more unified ask from the creative community, which then can branch out and each group can have their own iterations of that. But I think that we need to get together and we need to have four or five key principles that we're all behind so we can have a unified message because the worst thing we can do is have a splintered message from the creative community, particularly if we go into um, a, 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 any kind of accelerated reform. That's great. Well, thanks so much for your time, Richard, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. You too.